Hello, hello, and welcome to the Smoko Podcast. My name is Alexis Armstrong, your host. Nice to meet you. The Smoko Podcast is a place to celebrate and highlight women, trans women, and non-binary folk working within STEM and trade occupations. So please tune in, take a break, join us. We're on Smoko. Today, we're extremely lucky to be joined by the lovely Elizabeth Jimenez, Ellie, who is a good friend, and she works as a data manager at Ceres, which is the Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Sciences. And she's going to talk to us today about her experience working at Ceres, her experience as a data manager, her background in geosciences, and specifically this new discipline of geosciences, which is a mix between data science, mathematics, and geology. And so we're going to talk about that today. We're also going to have a really important conversation and also talk about diversity and representation within STEM. So thank you, Ellie, so much for coming on the show today. It's good to see you too. And thank you for letting me join into your conversation. Oh my goodness. You're welcome. Anytime you would like to come on the show, Ellie, you freaking say the word. Maybe just start us off. I ask everybody this one, but I'm always so genuinely curious is how did you discover this specialty? How did you discover geosciences? And your specialty is a little bit different, that it's a combination of geology and mathematics and data science. How did you fall in love with this field? What was it about yeah, it? I discovered this field in geosciences because I was first a geophysics major mm. in my freshman year. And I considered the freshman year to be a year of discovering what you like, what you don't like. I discovered I liked the field aspect that geology had much better and the opportunity that you had of camping and being outside. And that's something that just really resonated to me coming from a small town in Texas. That's something that I was looking for. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So that's what I went for. And honestly, I really enjoy having ability to go camping and be outside with my job. No, that's a perfect answer. That's how I got into it as well. Like I just Mm -hmm. found out that I could get paid to be outside and to live in the woods and go camping. And I was like, oh yeah, that's so easy. Like I'll become a geologist if that's what it takes to have that as my job. Sure. We've spoken a little bit about your specialty in geoscience and that data science is basically like the future of our industry. And I feel like you're steps ahead of everybody else that you're already in it. Could you describe what your field is and what that background is? And then what would be the role of data science and geoscience? How are those two linked? So my background is a mix of both geology and oceanography. I got curious about programming during my undergraduate classes. It wasn't even a class that it was required for my degree, but I was just curious and I took it. And I I really fell for learning about environmental processes and how to understand it better using computers and computer programming. And that's honestly how I got into it. It's so cool that you took this. I love that you searched that out, that it wasn't a required course, but you took programming. Is it coding? Is it cataloging the data? Is it creating the systems and architects to store the data? What does that actually look like? I do use Python and coding to archive this data. And the pipeline was previously done and constructed by my boss. And I'm Mm. working to keep up with it and do QAQC with it. It's a teamwork. It's the process of putting that together. But yeah, I'm happy. I pushed myself and I took that class randomly in college. And that's what led me to where I am now. I love that you were able to find this new field because that specialty and that combination of kind of computer science and like mathematics, truthfully, I love how you found your two passions of being like, I want to go outside and go camping. So I'm going to take geology instead of geophysics. And then... I love computers and programming and learning how to code and then finding this kind of this combination of the two. I think that's very special. So actually, you're right about this all being new. That class was basically just a class that one of my professors put to the board and was like, maybe some of my students are interested. And there wasn't any program that was constructed yet, but... The following years, it came together and actually they, there's a lot of programs at Texas a that you can enroll in data science and all of that now. And on it, honestly, it allows you to go into the workforce with all of those hugely valuable assets and use them from day one in your job. I believe you guys are like the chosen ones in geology. I'm like, my goodness, you're ahead of us. It's such good skills because I think in geology, 
in some sciences, you're taught really old techniques, which are wonderful. Mm -hmm. And don't get me wrong. But like I was taught on like paper maps and stuff. And then like you go into the workforce and they're like, here's a 3D modeling program. Please go model it. And you're like, oh, oh, no. Like I was used to like a protractor and like paper. Right. You have to all of a sudden learn really quickly on the job. And it's lovely that you have that in education. You have that at the university. Don't get me wrong. You need those skills about on paper. Because that really helps to understand what you're doing on the computer. Mentally thinking in 3D wise and learning how to use Protractor and all of that and making them matter really helps you and being able to understand what you're doing. I'm not going to put down um, gel and paper maps. You definitely need it. But I do love that you guys also have that skill early on. And your role now, right, like it gave you this beautiful foundation. You're working right now as a data manager at Ceres. Could you explain what Ceres is? What's the mission of it? And then what about this data sets and these data sets that you're working on? What makes them so important and maybe different than other data sets? Yeah, so Ceres, as you previously said, is a co-op. It stands for the Cooperative Institute of Research and Environmental Science. And it's a collaboration between the University of Colorado in Boulder and NOAA. And we're a group of 800 scientists that support NOAA. We're a bit of a big group, which does research in science and to better understand your environment and the benefit of the society. My goodness. Yeah, no biggie. No biggie whatsoever. (laughs) Benefit of society and understanding. I didn't realize how big it was. First off, I didn't realize it was 800 people. Do you guys collect the data as well or does Noah collect it and then you guys process the data? Is that kind of how it works? Um, We do both. We collect and store the data. I specifically work on the side of storage and maintaining. When you collect the data, is it similar data? Because Noah's all ocean specific and paleoceanography or oceanography. Is Ceres also oceanography based or is it all environment? All environment. So my team is based in the ocean and that's what we study. I'm part of the archive of maintaining noise from whales and passive acoustics, but my coworker, she does sonar and other types of data that she archives. No wonder it's for the benefit of all society. It's if you guys are yeah. looking at basically all natural data sets. I have another coworker that works on tsunami and creating a model that better interprets tsunami. So that's very cool. So it's a set of researchers and independent people that are looking at this data, working with NOAA as well, collecting their own data. And then there's a collection side and an archive side. Is it completely public? For what I do, it's public and it's made for scientists and industries and governments to use that's what we support what a cool project and what a cool initiative to be a part of Ali. the impact that you can have is pretty incredible and it's cool that it's all public that everyone can see it we've spoken a little bit or you just mentioned it that your role is on the archive side and it's looking at whales specifically could you describe your roles and responsibilities maybe a little bit more and then what does a typical day-to-day look like my role is a data manager. I passive acoustic recordings for this function. And that might sound a bit complicated because the first time I delved into oceanography, I was very far. So <laughs> I actually brought some audio samples to better explain this. And I shared it with you. Yes, you did. I listened to it all day. And so we're going to play it here. What you're about to listen to is basically what Ellie gets to listen to Almost every single day, this is her job, which is pretty incredible. So this would be an example of the data that she gets to hear. Here is the song of the whales. Very revealing whales, and those are actually recorded basically using and an instrument that has a microphone. You put it underneath the surface of the ocean, and you record those, and you can detect where those whales were and what species they were. And those recordings are day long, various hours, very huge, 
data sets that are sent to me and I archive them and make them publicly accessible. The first time I heard that sound, I was like, this is so beautiful and so striking. And it's so cool that this is your job, that you search through these data sets and then try to find them. I have a couple questions on that. The, the first one, could you explain a little bit of how this data is actually collected? Because I know you said underneath the surface of the water, but is it mostly through marine expeditions or through boats or is it like a buoy system? Where is this data coming from? Scientists actually have to go out on a ship and install these microphones in, inside of instruments onto buoys. Those buoys are left there for months re recording whales, fish, fish, real, anything that it can. And then scientists take that back, which is raw audio, and that is sent to me. From then on, scientists that collect that data actually are able to detect those species. Hmm. And that is also sent to me. And I archive that. I feel like you probably learned about it in oceanography mm -hmm. in school as well. And that's really cool to be part of that because those buoys are some of my favorite things in the entire world. The fact mm -hmm. that we have buoy systems all over the world just collecting data every single day, I think it's fascinating. So that's cool that you get to see that raw audio. The second question of that is with the whale species identification. So is that sent to you already completed by the scientists or do you now have an ear that you can listen to a certain type of baleen whale and you're like, yep, that's a humpback. That's a sperm whale. I actually receive the data once it's already been detected and then make that available. It's a resource for scientists all over to better understand where they're located and maybe whatever project they're working on, maybe they need samples of whales of Earth's specific ship or something because you can also get background noise from ships mm. and all of that. Actually, you can use that for any research project you want to do or a little side project. Do you have a favorite species? Like when someone sends in like a humpback that you're like, oh yeah, this is my favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> Not currently, but I should. <laughs> I'm sure you will eventually get one that you're like, ah, mm -hmm. oh, not this whale again. Like, I hate yeah. these guys. Or like, <laughs> there's something about that song of the whale that's not for you. I feel like you could take a lot from it. You could take my population size. You could take migration. You could take behavior. I'm sure you can probably mm -hmm. tell if some are juveniles or babies or moms. And um, that's really cool. It's a cool thing yeah. to do all day. Maybe you love this because of the whales, but What's something that you love about your job? What's something that's a little bit challenging? Something that I love is continually learning data science and coding. There's always something you can improve on and something you're learning. Improving on my coding skills on the job is something that I really love. And then something challenging is when I get a lot of drives from data providers and I have a lot of data on my desk and I have to go through it. It's a bit challenging. I could imagine yeah. just like the amount of data that you guys receive because I think you guys are a unique organization. I love the answer of continuously learning. One, I could imagine that with coding and with data science because it's such a rapidly changing specialty and it changes with new technology. Is there something that you're learning right now specifically that you're super juiced up on or want to learn on? A skill that I'm recently working on is learning how to use working with a database. Because I didn't have a database I could work on or access or do projects during college, I didn't have that skill set. So it's something I'm learning on the job and I'm really enjoying to learn. And then something in the future that I'm going to have to learn is we're migrating into the cloud. Okay. So all of our processes are going to be cloud-based and interacting in the cloud. So those are new skill sets that I'm going to have to learn, and I'm looking forward to that. How is it different from working right now, Python versus cloud or Python? Like at school, were you just learning the basics of Python, but didn't have the database to actually apply it? And then now all of right. a sudden, it's far bigger. Is Python and cloud totally separate things? Um, you can interact with the cloud using Python. Uh, Use the cloud and interact with it, but we're going to be in a much more in-depth process later okay. in the future. It'll go from like knowing maybe a little bit about it, using it once in a while to all of a sudden to be like your entire life is cloud-based right. and you need to understand and organize this program and create the structure of it probably mm -hmm. as well. Correct. Okay. Oh, that's going to be exciting. Definitely a challenge.
Is there anything that has really stuck out in it that has been unexpected that you've discovered in the data? And is there anything that you've discovered that you're like, oh my goodness, this is crazy? So something that has been unexpected is the customer base. So apart from receiving the data, we also provide the data to the public. I've been contacted by a lot of high school students asking for data for projects. That's okay. something I did not expect No, um, for high school students to ask for data. And honestly, it's very impressive. That cracks me up about it is they're basically just cold calling the U.S. government. <laughs> hey, I found your email. Like you're this national organization. It's not like it's a local small time thing. It's a huge organization. And for a 16 year old kid to be like, yeah, I'm going to cold call the U.S. government and I'm going to get your data is hilarious, is amazing. And kudos to them. I love that confidence. So we actually have our websites that are publicly available and they're hosted by NOAA and you can access and request that data. Still, it still yeah. takes that next level kind of 16 year old confidence, but I love that yeah. energy. That's what we need in science. Any unexpected like sounds or unexpected things captured by this kind of raw audio or has it been mostly surprised by who's been asking for your requests? It has been the surprise of who's been asking. We do get a lot of whales and girl sound, but yeah, it's for me, because I interact with the public and make sure that they get the data that they want, that has been something very surprising to me. The other question that you asked, if we work with any other government entity, so we do have a connection to the U.S. Navy. They make sure that all of the data that we make publicly available, it has been given security clearance just to make sure that we aren't putting anything that could be bad for security and national security. The Navy is in charge of clearing all of that before we receive that data. Wow. That's something that I wouldn't expect either, right? I was just mm -hmm. being so like narrow and science focused that you're like, you wouldn't even think to be like, yes, you probably also could take up acoustics from submarines or from ships. Yeah. or And like from that, mm -hmm. you can look at migration of ships instead of just looking at migration of right. whales. So I didn't yeah. even consider that. That's a crazy aspect of the data. That's a mm -hmm. wild thing that even has to be part of your process. Have you ever been contacted by the U.S. Navy if anything has skipped or they've talked to you or does it happen before you get the data? It happens before it gets to me. So yeah, the data providers send their data to the Navy and then the Navy sends it to us. So none of the data that we receive has that possibility. It's already been mm -hmm. pre-cleared and pre-scrubbed. It's a weird connection that I wouldn't immediately think, but it's correct. You can't put all of that type of sensitive data on a public database for the world mm -hmm. to see if it hasn't been properly scrubbed and properly looked at. When we're talking about your job and talking about geoscience and talking about data science and geoscience, where do you think the future of this industry is going to go? What's something that excites you about this field? Where do you think this future of this industry is going to go? I think geoscience is moving towards a better understanding of global processes through machine learning and AI. That's the way I think it's going to grow. And we're seeing it in new projects that you, if you go to conferences, you can see that already happening. But in a much more in-depth is where I think we're moving towards. Could you explain those? I haven't been on the conference circuit for a little bit, so I'm ignorant to it. What is an example of that project using deep learning and machine learning in geologic processes? What does that look like? Machine learning is basically teaching a computer the same process how a child learns. Okay. The way I think about it is when you're a child and you're playing with those little triangles that are made out of wood and you try to get the red cube into the red little square, basically you're teaching the child how to match colors. The child struggles in the first times, and then after a couple of times, it learns that process, and it learns that red goes with red. And that's the same kind of logic that is going on with machine learning and AI. One of the projects that I was potentially thinking about doing is I saw an issue during my college. So one thing that really takes a lot of time is identification of minerals. It's hard, and you have to have an eye for it. But if you were to show a computer various images and have the identification already done, 
it would essentially learn what a mineral looks like under the microscope, which is oh, wow. something you could use machine learning and teach like, and speed everything. Oh my so, yeah, that's, goodness. That's a project that I've wanted to work on, but yeah, it's been on the sidelines a little. Ellie, yeah. that is an amazing project. Do you know how much <laughs> time that would save you during like thin section analysis? Yeah. Looking at slides, that is the bane of your existence of trying to do like your little heat maps. Oh, is it a true 30% or is it 25? Like it takes forever to do that. Right. And that's what machine learning can do in geoscience. Like, there's so many different aspects to it. I didn't get to take this into. So that's where I think geoscience is moving towards making discovery and better understanding of our environment much more efficient. Thank you for explaining it so simply because I don't really know what machine learning is. I've learned about it, but I don't actually understand the concept of what it actually means on the program side of how do you create machine learning within a computer system or within a computer program. But geoscience, it's such an interpretive science. You're, you're trying to establish patterns and recognition of colors, of faults, of minerals. It would be really nice if you could have that database and if you could automate it. The main thing with geology is like 10 geologists will look at the same rock. And they'll say it's 13 different types of rocks. It would be really nice to have a little bit of help there and a little programming power behind it. When do you think that future is going to be? Do you think that future is already here? Or do you think it's in the next like 10 years? We're at the beginning of it. I think we're exploring. That's the beauty of science. It's all about experimenting and see where things go and what it leads us to. I think we're at exploration in that sector is where I think we're at the exploration side of it, being on the data side of it, do you have any concerns about that? Because I know that's something that a lot of people talk about is AI and the dangers of AI. Should we be concerned in geoscience or do you think it's just a positive on pattern recognition? With programming, you have to make sure that there are some caveats and something you have to pay attention to is don't get too comfortable. As we said previously, you have to know what your map looks like on paper so that you understand it. The same thing with machine learning and other technologies. You have to understand what's going on to be able to notice if there were errors that were skipped on. If your result was good, what is your result telling you? And you really can. But those questions are something that we shouldn't get comfortable with and we should always be questioning. The foundations of science, basically, and the foundations of quality checking in your data to be like, can we trust this data set? Can we trust yeah. that measurement? How was it created? And then the implications of that data, what does that actually mean in the system? I love it. Thank you very much, Ali, for walking through your specialty and your job as such mm -hmm. completely. I know that something that's really important to you is representation and increasing diversity in STEM. And one story that always stays in my mind forever for the rest, the all of time is when me and you, we were on the ship and we were talking about jury duty and how every single person hates jury duty. And they were all complaining and bitching that they were part of it. And you were so excited. And you're like, it's my duty to go to jury duty because I live in a community that's predominantly white. I'm a Latina in my community. I'm a rarity within it. I, my voice and my opinion needs to be heard. And so I want to represent my community and I want to go to jury duty. And it was a complete different viewpoint that no one else had shared or even had thought about when they were in that same position, when they were being selected for jury duty. For me, it changed my mindset of it and it reframed it. And I will always think of that moment. I absolutely love that story. It lives in my head rent free. And I know Diversity representation is really important for you. Could you maybe describe the role of representation in your career, why it's so important to you, and then your experience being a mentor for young women and Latinas in geoscience? So first off, thank you for bringing back that. <laughs> you're welcome. Sorry about the journey. <laughs> yeah. I think about that too. Representation is very important to me, basically because I felt, and I am a minority in STEM. Since I was in placed in advanced classes in middle school all the way to my current job, it feels different and it felt different since I was in middle school, but you get used to it at some point and then randomly you start feeling uncomfortable again. I think it's specifically very important to a diverse workforce because it allows us to talk 
with people from different backgrounds and different views of how they see it, how they see issues. So that's something that is very important to me. And it's a change that I do see happening in my industry, but in specifically with younger generations, like mm-hmm. my generation and new employees that are being hired. But I do see the difference between my generation and older generation. That change is happening and it's something that we have to continue working mm-hmm. and putting effort into. I'm happy that the change is happening. You can already see it when you look at like older generation to the new generation, even like to my generation or yours, that the change is already starting and beginning. And I do think that we need to keep on having these conversations and it has to be top of mind for everybody within the industry and within the culture of it to make an actual meaningful change and to be like, I'm used to feeling uncomfortable. I I couldn't imagine that. And then all of a sudden it does come crashing back to you for sure. Of course it does to be like, nope, I'm still different. It still feels really uncomfortable. Being a girl in geoscience is already something Mm -hmm. that feels a target on your back sometimes, or you feel different than your colleagues. I couldn't imagine another layer to it. And just, I'm sorry that you have to deal with that. If that's what you have, you have to work with it. In your career, has there been kind of something actionable that has made you feel welcome or not tokenized? What's something that the community can do to support you and to increase diversity in STEM, to make that environment more welcoming? So something that has helped me to feel included and tokenized is for me to be included in decision-making station. And having people actually listen is the key into what you have to say and what your opinion is, that has made me feel good. Being included within decision-making and then listened. Is that kind of the actionable mm-hmm. step? Is there anything else that helps or is that the main one? I think that's the main one for me. Being a mentor and representation yourself, right? To be a mentor yourself. What's your advice to other women and to other Latinas just starting within this community and within this industry? Whether it's this industry or any other, I would say to believe in yourself. And if you have grit and you keep at it, it'll all work out. It's simple, but it's perfect. It's just grit, believe in yourself, keep going. Yeah. I love that advice for it. In terms of diversity, in terms of representation, is there anything right now within the industry that gives you hope? Is there initiatives or organizations that you really can see yourself in and resonate with? Internally, in where I work, there are groups of minorities and having those conversations and you can listen in and it's like an open office meeting where anybody can speak up and conversations are being heard, which is something surprising. And I was very delighted to see when I joined my workplace. That's something that I really enjoy. You asked me how can the industry or workplaces better support minorities in STEM. So I think the key part of this is that the change needs to happen. And we need to make it happen for now and coming to, into the future. How I got here is actually I was introduced to STEM through a field trip to the shell company in Houston, into their office. So they actually invited all of the seventh grade girls from my school. They were invited to go talk to women engineers. And we did a hands-on project where we built a floating device out of anything we could find at home. Learning from women engineers what STEM was and the importance of it at a young, very young age is what been raised to all of those possibilities. I didn't even know what an engineer was at that age, what it really meant for a woman to be in science. So that definitely opened my view into other resources. And it's something that I think companies should really invest on, having that to a younger audience. Thank you very much for telling me that story. That's fantastic. And I think it's great advice for an organization because you're right, they have the ability and they have the funds to really invest in early education and in STEM and in engineering. I love that you had no idea what an engineer was until you had this kind of like interactive moment 
What's beautiful about that is that when you're older and you hear about engineering and when you're talking about, oh, hey, what are you going to do in the future? You now have this blueprint. You have this viewpoint that an engineer can be a woman because you saw it when you were seven years old. That foundation has already been built of representation early on to be like, yep, I look like an engineer. I look like a scientist. It's not someone who doesn't look like me. You also mentioned at work that you have groups and minority groups that are talking together and talking about what does diversity look like in our workplace and within our organization. But like you said, something that's helps you feel included or feel non-tokenized within this industry is when you're giving decision-making power. And I'm guessing that that organization also has decision-making power within your organization. Yes, they do. They do talk to decision-making, like the higher-ups, people I on board, basically making sure that every voice is heard is the mission of that group. And that's fantastic mm-hmm. that you have a direct way to speak to higher-ups and to speak to decision-makers within the organization and to make an impact. Thank you so much for talking about everything today. I really appreciate yeah. it. Uh, thank, thank you, you for, for letting me. Yeah, thank you for letting me join into the conversation. And anytime you want me to join in, just let me know. Okay, I will keep you to it. Thank you so much for talking with us today. It's so lovely to see you. Thank you for coming on the show. Okay, bye guys. Thank you for listening. This is the Smoko Podcast. <laughs>